God bless you, everybody. Uh, we have a special uh, live program that I'm doing right now. Uh, God bless you, GGCC TV Repost. Uh, God bless you, Gino and Gina. God bless you. Um, I want to read the Bible for you. Uh, every time I have an opportunity, uh, God bless you, Penny Johan. Uh, Mindy, God bless you. Tan, God bless you. April, God bless you. Um, every time I have an opportunity to read the Bible for our Instagram, I I take pleasure in that and it's a blessing. Uh, so I want to read the book of Mark for you. Now I'm going to do something different. Normally I would just read it through. So as I'm reading... I'm going to explain to you the situation, okay? I'm going to explain to you the situation, uh, what's going on in the text, explaining a little bit uh, what the application is uh, according to what we're reading. Amen? Uh, Nivi D. Shirley, God bless you. Josh and, and Ash, God bless you. Uh, GGCC Repose, Pastor, pray for peace on Richie Costello family today. They are putting him to rest. God's peace in Jesus' name. May the Lord comfort them. May the Lord strengthen them and give him comfort to the whole family in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's read the book of Mark. Do you know that the book of Mark is uh, actually the first book of the Gospels. Yes, it is the first book of the Gospels. We always think it's Matthew because it's in the beginning. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Well, the reality is uh, Mark was the first book of the Gospels to be written. I believe it was 50 AD, if I'm not mistaken. It's the first book. So, I'm reading out of the New Living Translation. Let's get into the Word of God. Uh, if you have a Bible, uh, you could read with me as I read for you. And let this bless your hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Mark, chapter 1, verse 1. This is the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. It began just as the prophet Isaiah had written, Look, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, and he will prepare your way. He is a voice shouting in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord's coming. Clear the road for him. This is talking about John the Baptist. That's what it's referring to. Verse 4, Mark 1.4 this messenger was John the Baptist. There it is. It's telling you what the prophet Isaiah was talking about. He was in the wilderness and preached that people should be baptized to show that they had turned to God to receive forgiveness for their sins. So the baptism of John the Baptist was a baptism of repentance, telling the world, everybody that's watching that person getting baptized, look, I repented of what I did wrong. So if there was somebody that he did wrong, he goes to John the Baptist, gets baptized in front of him, and that tells that's not the same guy anymore. He's not going to do it anymore. So that's what it is. Verse 5, all of Judea, including all of the people of Jerusalem, went out to see and hear John. And when they confessed their sins, he baptized them in the Jordan River. So there you go. People came to John the Baptist I did wrong, I'm a, I'm a lying tax collector, I'm a bad Pharisee teacher, I'm a bad person, I did wrong, I want my forgiveness and I don't want to do it again. And so he gets baptized. That was the baptism. It wasn't come and be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That is not the case. This was, uh, I did wrong, uh, John, and I messed up, uh, and I want to start fresh. They get baptized. In a way, it's kind of like they're asking for forgiveness, but they don't do it anymore. 
Verse 6, chapter 1, verse 6. His clothes were woven from coarse camel hair, and he wore a leather belt around his waist. For food, he ate locusts and wild honey. Now, there's a reason it says what he was wearing and what he was eating. As a Levite in the tribe of Levite and priests, well, Elizabeth and Zechariah, the father and mother of John the Baptist, they had beautiful clothes. They were able to serve in the temple. They have every great food to eat, even the sacrificial food that they would give. They would eat it too also. So this was a major thing for John to not want those type of life. He went into the wilderness for one reason, to be a witness when they see Jesus to point them out. That's it. That was his ministry. He neglected himself, how he wore clothes and also what he ate, what he ate. Mark 1, 7. John announced, someone is coming soon who is greater than I am, so much greater that I am not even worthy to stoop down like a slave and untie the straps of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Mark chapter 1, verse 9. God bless you, everybody, coming into our program. This is Reading the Bible. Reading the Bible. I'm reading out of Mark. I'm giving you a little insight to the reading, something different. I'm not just reading. I'm explaining the context. So Mark chapter 1, verse 9. The heading is called The Baptism and Temptation of Jesus. One day Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee, and John baptized him in the Jordan River. As Jesus came up out of the water, he saw the heavens splitting apart, and the Holy Spirit descending on him like a dove. Now let's stop there. Who's seeing this? Is it Jesus? Or is it John? It's John that's seen all this happening. He saw the heavens splitting apart. He is referring to John the Baptist. He saw the heavens split, splitting, uh, splitting apart and the Holy Spirit descending on him like a dove. Verse 11, and a voice from heaven said, you are my dearly loved son and you bring me great joy. Now, there's a conversation going on. Aikodo conversation is between the father and the son. And John is in the middle hearing the conversation. Mark 1, 12. The spirit then compelled Jesus to go into the wilderness where he was tempted by Satan for 40 days. He was out among the wild animals, and angels took care of him. Mark 1, 14. Later on, after John was arrested, Jesus went into Galilee where he preached God's good news, the gospel. The time, this, these are red letters, first time Jesus is talking. The time promised by God has come at last, he announced. The kingdom of God is near. Repent of your sins. Believe the good news. Now, what's the big difference? John baptized them in a baptism of repentance. But now Jesus is saying, the kingdom of God. Do you know who's the kingdom of God? Jesus is the kingdom of God. He is the king of kings, the Lord of lords. So he is the kingdom of God. And so that's the good news. His birth, his life, and eventually, he didn't die yet, but eventually his death and resurrection. And so that's what he's telling them. You need to believe in me. Repent and believe in me. That's what Jesus is saying here. Mark 1, 16, and the heading is called the first disciples. One day as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, Come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. Mark 1, 19. 
A little further up ashore, Jesus saw Zebedee's sons, James and John, in a boat repairing their nets. He called them at once, and they also followed him, leaving their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men. Now, let me give you a little insight regarding the Gospels. John the Baptist had two disciples that followed Jesus. They left John and they started to follow Jesus. And these two disciples are John, the younger brother, the younger or the brother of Peter. He's the youngest of all the apostles. And, and no, I'm sorry, Andrew, the brother of Peter, and John, the youngest of all the apostles. Now, these are the two disciples that John the Baptist had. Now, how do I know this? By reading all four Gospels. They add a little bit to the information in the other Gospel. You get some more info. Here in the, Mar in the book of Mark, you don't get all the, 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 the information that you get from the other three. So, John and Andrew were John the Baptist's followers. John says, look, the lamb that takes away the sins of the world. And they left John and started to follow Jesus. Now, here... Jesus is seen talking to John, talking to Peter. So this had to come later. And this is the situation now. Mark 1, 21. The heading, it says, Jesus cast out an evil spirit. Jesus and his companions went to the town of Capernaum. When the Sabbath day came, he went into a synagogue and began to teach. I want you to think about that for a little bit. He began to teach. So he stepped up and he started to teach in the synagogues. The people were amazed at his teachings. For he taught with real authority. Quite unlike the teacher's of religious law. Mark 1, 23. Suddenly a man in the synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit began shouting, Why are you interfering with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One sent from God. Mark 1, 25. Jesus cut him short. Be quiet. Come out of that man, he ordered. At that, the evil spirit screamed, threw the man into a convulsion, and then came out of him. Amazement gripped the audience, and they began to discuss what had happened. What sort of new teaching is this? They asked excitedly. It has such authority. Even evil spirits obey his orders. The news about Jesus spread quickly throughout the entire region of Galilee. Jesus heals many people. Mark 1, 29. After Jesus left the synagogue with James and John, they, they went to Simon and Andrew's home. Now Simon's mother-in-law was sick in bed with a high fever. They told Jesus about her right away. So he went to her bedside, took her by the hand, and helped her to sit up. And then the fever left her. And she prepared a meal for them. I want to say God bless you, everybody, coming into our program. I am reading the book of Mark from the New Living Translation. We are in chapter 1, verse 32. That evening after sunset, many sick and demon-possessed people were brought to Jesus. The whole town gathered at the door to watch. So Jesus healed many people who were sick with various diseases, and he cast out many demons. 
But because the demons knew who he was, he did not allow them to speak. Interesting. Mark chapter 1, verse 35. The heading is called, Jesus Preaches in Galilee. Before daybreak the next morning, Jesus got up and went out to an isolated place to pray. Notice he goes to an isolated place to pray where nobody's there. It's just him. And he went to pray. Who is he praying to? His dad. Later, Simon and the others went out to find him. When they found him, they said, everyone is looking for you. Mark 138. But Jesus replied, we must go on to other towns as well, and I will preach to them too. This is why I came. So he traveled throughout the region of Galilee, preaching in the synagogues and casting out demons. Mark 1 verse 40. The heading is called Jesus heals a man with leprosy. A man with leprosy came and knelt in front of Jesus begging to be healed. If you are willing, you can heal me and make me clean, he said. Moved with compassion. You see, compassion is something that a human being has. Jesus felt this. Moved with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched him. I am willing, he said, be healed. Instantly, the leprosy disappeared and the man was healed. Nobody was supposed to touch a leprous person. The leprous man took a chance to come to Jesus in faith because he could have been stoned to death, killed. He's supposed to scream out, unclean, unclean, and people would run. But here, you see the person coming to seek the healing, stepped out in faith, and Jesus honored it, and blessed him, healed him. Amazing. Verse, chapter 1, verse 42. Instantly the leprosy disappeared and the man was healed. Then Jesus sent him on his way with a stern warning. Don't tell anyone about this. Instead, go to the priest and let him examine you. Take along an offering required in the law of Moses for those who have been healed of leprosy. This will be a public testimony that you have been cleansed. Everybody's question has always been, why did Jesus tell people, don't tell them what I did? Well, the reason is he just started his ministry. He has three years to go. You see? And he cannot get into a place where he will be um, stopped. So this is the reason he said, don't tell. But they still went out and said it. This is not Q&A, everybody. I'm reading the book of Mark in the New Living Translation. Mark chapter 1, verse 45. But the man went and spread the word, proclaiming to everyone what had happened. As a result, large crowds soon surrounded Jesus and he couldn't publicly enter a town anymore. You see, that's why he said, don't tell no one. He had to stay out in the secluded places, but people from everywhere kept coming to him. So he stopped going into towns because there was too much, too many people. So he had to go outside of town and everybody would come to him. You see, but that wasn't, Jesus' direction. He told people, don't tell, so that he won't be overwhelmed. Do you understand? Mark chapter 2, the heading is, Jesus heals a paralyzed man. When Jesus returns to Capernaum several days later, the news spread quickly that he, had, he was back home. Now, he went to Galilee, Capernaum, he went to see John the Baptist. He went into the desert. He went back to Capernaum. He's been going back and forth. If you have an idea of the map, you're looking about approximately 
traveling maybe about a hundred miles. That's it. That's all he's traveled so far. Uh, Mark chapter 2, verse 2. Soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no more room, even outside the door, while he was preaching God's word to them. Now, let me explain. Jesus had a home. Jesus had his own house. He had his own little living quarters. He had his own responsibility. And you see it here, his home, his life. Very interesting, Mange Kodo. Verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 3. Four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd. So they dug a hole through the roof above his head. And then they lowered the man on his mat. Right down in front of Jesus, seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, My child, your sins are forgiven. Now this was a big, big exposure to who he is. This, these words was exposing his Godhead, his authority, his sovereignty. Mark chapter 2, verse 6. But some of the teachers of religious law were sitting there, thought to themselves, what is he saying? This is blasphemy. Only God could forgive sins. Verse 8. Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking, so he asked them, why do you question this in your heart? Is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or stand up, pick up your mat, and walk? So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. Which means you're healed, you're forgiven, now go on your way. Mark 2, 12. And the man jumped up, grabbed his mat, and walked out through the stunned onlookers. They were all amazed and praised God, exclaiming, We've never seen anything like this before. Mark chapter 2, verse 13. Then Jesus went out to the lake shore again and taught the crowds that were coming to him. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at his tax collector's booth. This guy is Matthew that wrote the book of Matthew. His name is also Levi. Levi invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. There were many people of this kind among Jesus' followers. But when the teachers of religious law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with tax collectors and other sinners, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with such scum? Mark 2, 17. When Jesus heard this, he told them, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I have come to call not those who think they are religious, but those who know they are sinners. Mark chapter 2, verse 18. Once when John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, some people came to Jesus and asked, Why don't your disciples fast like John's disciples and the Pharisees do? Jesus replied, Do wedding guests fast? while celebrating with the groom? Of course not. They can't fast while the groom is with them, but someday the groom will be taken away from them and then they will fast. Besides, who would patch old clothes with new cloth? For the new patch would shrink and rip away from the old cloth, leaving an even bigger tear than before. And no one puts new wine into old wineskin, for the new wine would burst with the old wine 
would burst into the new wine skin. New wine calls for new wine skin. Mark 2, 23. One Sabbath day, as Jesus was walking some grain fields, his disciples began breaking off heads of grain to eat. But the Pharisees said to Jesus, Look, why are they break, breaking the law by harvesting grain on the Sabbath? They would just eat it off and put it in their mouth. And Mark chapter 2 verse 25 says, Jesus says to them, Haven't you ever read the scriptures, what, what David did when he had his companions were hungry. He went into the house of God during the days when Abiathar was high priest and broke the law by eating the sacred loaves of bread that only the priests are allowed to, to eat. He also gave some to his companions. Verse 27, Then Jesus said to them, The Sabbath was made to meet the needs of the people and not people to meet the requirements of the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even over the Sabbath. Amen. Chapter 3, verse 1. The heading is called Jesus Heals on the Sabbath. Jesus went into the synagogue again and noticed a man with a deformed hand. Since it was the Sabbath, Jesus' enemies watched him closely. If he healed the man's hand, they planned to accuse him of working on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man, Come and stand in front of everyone. Then he turned to his critics and asked, Does the law permit good deeds on the Sabbath? Or is it a day for doing evil? Is this a day to save life or to destroy it? But they wouldn't answer him. Chapter 3, verse 5 of Mark. He looked around at them angrily and was deeply saddened by their hard hearts. Then he said to the man, hold out your hand. So the man held out his hand and it was restored. At once the Pharisees went away and met with the supporters of Herod to plot how to kill Jesus. Could you turn on the light, please? Amen. God bless you, everybody. Suntolto Model, welcome to uh, uh, reading the Bible. I'm reading the Bible for you. I'm reading the book of Mark. I'm reading it in the New Living Translation. And we are in chapter 3, verse 7. The heading says, Crowds follow Jesus. Jesus went out to the lake with his disciples, and a large crowd followed him. They came from all over Galilee, Judea, Jerusalem, in Dumaya, from east of the Jordan River, even from as far of north as Tyre and Sidon. That's approximately 400 miles away. The news about his miracles had spread far and wide. Vast numbers of people came to see him. So basically now what's going on is he's not looking for people now. The people are looking for him. Mark chapter 3 verse 9. Jesus instructed his disciples to have a boat ready so the crowds would not crush him. He had healed many people that day, so all the sick people eagerly pushed forward to touch him. And whenever those possessed by evil spirits caught sight of him, the spirits would throw them to the ground in front of him, straight shrieking, You are the Son of God. But Jesus sternly commanded the spirits not to reveal who he was. Why would he do that? Because his time is not yet come. He still has another two years. Afterwards, Jesus went up on the mountain and called out the ones he wanted to go with him and they came to him then he appointed 12 of them and called them his apostles they were so 
they were to accompany him, and he would send them out to preach, giving them authority to cast out demons. Here are their names. Simon, these are the apostles. Out of all the disciples, see, many, many people came to Jesus. But Jesus chose 12. And what, the first one, the leader, is Simon, who his name is Peter. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, but Jesus nicknamed them sons of thunder. Andrew, which is Peter's brother. Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and then Judas Iscariot, who later betrayed him. Mark chapter 3, verse 20. One time Jesus entered a house, and the crowds began to gather again. Soon he and his disciples couldn't even find time to eat. When his family heard what was happening, they tried to take him away. Here's, he's out of his mind, they said. Hmm. So look what's going on now. At this moment, right now, everybody is, is a wave of people, literally exaggerated. Thousands of people are following Jesus and they're all getting healed. They're all getting blessed with teachings, healings. Now the disciples and Jesus don't even have time to eat. It was truly, truly amazing what's going on. So all the attention that Jesus is getting, his family, see Jesus had brothers and sisters and his mother. His dad passed away at this point, old stepfather Joseph. And so right now, his family is telling him, you're out of your mind. Chapter 3 of Mark, verse 22. But the teachers of religious law who had arrived from Jerusalem said, he's possessed by Satan, the prince of demons. That's where he gets the power to cast out demons. Jesus called him over and responded with the illustration. How can Satan cast out Satan, he asked. A kingdom divided by civil war will collapse. Similarly, a family splintered by feuding will fall apart, or a family that's divided. And if Satan is divided, and fights against himself, how can he stand? He would never survive. Let me illustrate this further, or let me give you another example. Who is powerful enough to enter the house of a strong man like Satan and plunder his goods? Only someone even stronger. Someone who could tie him up and then plunder his house. I tell you the truth, all sin and blasphemy can be forgiven. But anyone who blasphemes the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. This is a sin with eternal consequences. He told them this because they were saying he's possessed by an evil spirit. Now let me explain a little bit more about blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. You cannot blaspheme the Holy Spirit by accident. Ayoy, I think I just blasphemed. Yoy, I blasphemed God. Yoy, Devla, I don't know what I just did. No, no, no. Blaspheme means that you intentionally know that God is doing it, but you're saying it's not God. And that is, in a way, rejecting God, walking away from God. That is why blaspheming against the Holy Spirit is so evil that God says it's not forgiven. So you cannot blaspheme the Holy Spirit by accident. You do it intentionally, knowingly. Mark chapter 3, verse 31. 
Then Jesus' mother and his brothers came to see him. They stood outside and sent word for him to come out and talk with them. There was a crowd sitting around Jesus, and someone said, Hey, Jesus, your mother and your brothers are outside asking for you. Jesus replied, Who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Then he looked at those around him and said, Look, these are my mother and brothers. Anyone who does God's will is my brother, my sister, and my mother. That's amazing. So basically, why was his mother and brothers and sisters outside in the first place? Let me tell you what's going on. Shava Dilayla. Shava, what are you doing? They were trying to take him away from what he's doing. And so he told them, you guys are more important than my own family because they're not following me. You are. Mark chapter 4 verse 1 The parable of the farmer scattering seed Once again Jesus began teaching by the lake shore a very large crowd soon gathered around him so he got into a boat and he sat in the boat while all the people remained on the shore he taught them by telling many stories in forms of parables such as this one now, just to let you guys know, those of you that don't know, when you're on the, on the beach and you get on the boat and you speak towards the, the shore, it becomes an echo and you could hear loud. The same thing when you are on a hill and you speak towards the people, what happens is there's like an echo and people could hear you. Now, yes. Jesus is God. God supernaturally can make every person hear him. But this is something to understand. He gets in a boat, goes a little bit into the water and starts to teach. And he gives the first parable. Listen, he says, a farmer went out to plant some seed. As he scatters it across his field, some of the seed fell on footpath. And birds came and ate it. Now the footpath is, it's, it's, it's where people walk. It's where the path is, is very zuralo. It's where, could you close the door, Susan? It's where the ground is compressed because of all the walking. And so the seeds that the seed sower fell, throw, fell on is the path. That's the path. As he scattered it across his fields, some seed fell on the footpath and the birds came and ate it because it didn't go on the ground. Other seeds fell on shallow soil with underlying rock. The seed sprouted quickly because of the soil was shallow. But the plant soon wiltered under the hot sun, and since it didn't have deep roots, it died. This is at the edge of the path. There's like a rock and, and dirt, but because it doesn't go into the ground, just like the scripture said, it just grew, but just burned up. Nothing happened. Verse 7, chapter 4. Other seed fell among thorns that grew up and choked out the tender plants so they produced no grain. Still other seed fell on the fertile soil and they sprouted, grew, and produced a crop that was 30, 60, and even 100 times as much as had been planted. Then he said, anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Mark chapter 4, verse 10. Later, when Jesus was alone with the 12 disciples and with the others who were gathered around, they asked him, what about the parables mean? He replied, you are permitted to understand the secret 
of the kingdom of God. But I use parables for everything I say to outsiders so that the scriptures might be fulfilled. Now Jesus is quoting prophecy from the Old Testament. When they see what I do, they will learn nothing. When they hear what I say, they will not understand. Otherwise, they will turn to me and be forgiven. Now, why is this said? It sounds confusing. Isn't, isn't Jesus here to save the world? Isn't Jesus here to do for everybody? Why doesn't Jesus want them? Why doesn't he just speak? Well, here's the thing. At this time, he will be getting persecuted. All the people that are coming to him, they're coming to him because they're Jews. And they know about the prophecies that say that one will come that will conquer and win over their enemies. So they think that supporting Jesus is for their benefit. For their benefit. For that's the reason what's going on with them. They're coming to God, but they don't want to be used by God. They want to use Him for their benefit. But those who truly follow Him, those are given the secret of the gospel. Mark chapter 4, verse 13. Then Jesus said to them, If you can't understand the meaning of these parables, how will you understand all of the other parables? The farmer plants seed by taking God's word to others. The seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message only to have Satan come at once and take it away. The seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, are not dedicated, committed, they don't last long. They fell away as soon as they have problems or persecution, persecuted for believing God's word. The seed that fell among the thorns represents others who hear God's word. But all too quickly, the message is crowded out by the worries of this life and the lure of wealth and the desires of other things. So no fruit is produced. I believe Amelegom fall under this. We fall under this type of soil, the thorny soil. And the seeds fell on good soil represents those who hear and accept God's word and produced means applied and practice a harvest of 30, 60, or even 100 times as much as had been planted. Amen. Mark chapter 4, verse 21. Then Jesus asked them, would anyone light a lamp and then put it under a basket or under a bed? Of course not. A lamp is placed on a stand where its light will shine. For everything that is hidden will eventually be brought into the open. And every secret will be brought to light. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Guys, this is a major thing. This point that Jesus is saying, it is major. Because, me, whatever you're trying to hide, Whatever you're trying to do in secret, eventually it's going to come out. It will come out. So you might as well repent and just don't do it anymore. Before the dispolajav. The word of God tells us, teaches us, that the reason you are not exposed, the reason nobody knows what you're doing, is because God is giving you an opportunity to repent. Amen? Mark chapter 4 verse 24. Then he added, pay close attention to what you hear. The closer you listen, the more understand you, you will be given. And you will receive even more. For those who listen to my teachings, more understanding will be given. I love that. But for those who are not listening, even the little understanding they have will be taken away from them. Wow. 
Mark 4, 26. Jesus also said the kingdom of God is like a farmer who scatters seeds on the ground. Night and day while he's asleep or awake, the seed sprouts and grows, but he does not understand how it happens. The earth produces the crops on its own. First a leaf blade pushes through, then the heads of the wheat are formed, then finally the grain ripens. And as soon as the grain is ready, the farmer comes and harvests it with a sickle, it's a knife. And for the harvest times has come. It's saying that God makes everything grow. And the timing is as it's produced and grows and it's ready, then Avelo farmer, I cheat them. Mark chapter 4, verse 30. Jesus said, How can I describe the kingdom of God? The story should I use to illustrate it? Or what story should I use to illustrate it? It is like a mustard seed planted in the ground. It is the smallest of all seeds, but it becomes the largest of all garden plants. It grows long branches and birds can make its nests in it, in its shade. Mark chapter 4, verse 33. Jesus said many similar stories and illustrations to teach the people as much as they could understand. In fact, in his public ministry, he never taught without using parables. But afterwards, when he was alone with his disciples, he would explain everything to them. Mark chapter 4, verse 35. As evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, Let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they took Jesus in the boat and started out, leaving the crowds behind although other boats followed. But soon a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat and it began to fill with water. Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. The disciples woke him up shouting, Teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the water, Silence! and be still. Suddenly the wind stopped and there was a great calm. Then he asked them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? Chapter four, verse 41. The disciples were absolutely terrified. Who is this man? They asked each other. Even the wind and the waves obeyed him. Mark chapter 5, verse 1. I want to say God bless you everybody coming into our program. This is not Q&A. This is reading through the Bible. Today I'm doing a special segment on the book of Mark. I'm reading. Uh, and as I'm reading, I'll explain as God leads me. I'll explain on these certain topics. What the, talk, what the scripture is talking about. The context. As I'm reading, I will be explaining. God bless you. Mark chapter 5 verse 1. So they arrived at the other side of the lake, in the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus climbed out of the boat, a man possessed by an evil spirit came out from the cemetery to meet him. This man lived among the burial caves and could no longer be restrained even with a chain. Whenever he was put into chains and shackles, as he often was, he snapped the chains from his wrists and smashed the shackles. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Day and night, he wandered among the burial caves and in the hills, howling and cutting himself with sharp stones. Mark 5, verse 6. When Jesus was still some distance away, the man saw him ran to him, ran to meet him, and bowed low before him. With a shriek, he screamed, why are, you, why are you interfering with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In the name of God, I begged you, I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had already said to the spirit, come out of the man 
you evil spirit. Amen. This is what's going on. Kako gajo perdosas duhore ajungale. And this is what's going on. So, there is a situation right now. Avel leste, and immediately, jantar, saco de la duhore anda leste. Now, look at the way he responds. When Jesus was still some distance away, the man saw him, ran to meet him, bowed low before him with a shriek. He screamed, why are you interfering with me? Jesus, son of the most high God. They recognized him. In the name of God, I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had already said to the spirit, come out of the man, you evil spirit. Verse 9, then Jesus demanded, what is your name? Now, Mangesikako, very interesting. Why, why would it Jesus ask, what is your name? Jesus knows everything. Jesus knows everything. But here's the key. Everything confesses to Jesus. Even evil spirits cannot hide from Jesus and cannot hide anything. They must expose themselves. When he says, what is your name? It's basically telling him, expose yourself. That's what's going on here. And he replied, my name is Legion, because there are many of us inside this man. Then the evil spirit begged him again and again not to send them to some distant place. There happened to be a large herd of pigs feeding on the hillside nearby. Send us into those pigs, the spirit begged. Let us enter them. So Jesus gave them permission. The evil spirits came out of the man and entered the pigs. An entire herd of 2,000 pigs plunged down the steep hillside into the lake and drowned in the water. All right. What does this story mean? What is that distant place? Kai Penel, you're going to send us. Don't send us to, that, this, to some distant place. That distant place is a place of judgment. Here, he puts them in the pigs. Why did God allow him to those evil spirits to go into the pigs because pigs are Melale animals? Because Jews don't eat pigs? No, no. Jesus knew that those pigs would die. And once those pigs die, those evil spirits don't have nowhere else to go. That's why it happened. And that's why God allowed it. Verse 14 of chapter 5. The herdsmen fled to the nearby town and the surrounding countryside, spreading the news as they ran. People rushed out to see what had happened. A crowd soon gathered around Jesus, and they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons. He was sitting there fully clothed and perfectly sane, and they were all afraid. Then those who had seen what had what what happened told the others about the demon-possessed man and the pigs. And the crowds began pleading with Jesus to go away and leave them alone. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. But Jesus said, no, go home to your family and tell them everything the Lord has done for you and how merciful he has been. So now he tells this guy, go and tell your family what happened. Everybody else was, don't do it. Here he tells him, go as a witness. So the man started off to visit 10 towns of that region and began to proclaim the great things Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed at what he told them, which means he went to preach. He went to minister to help. Mark 5, 21. 
Jesus got into a boat again and went back to the other side of the lake, where a large crowd gathered around him on the seashore. Then a leader of the local synagogues, whose name was Jairus, arrived. When he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet, pleading servant, fervently with him, My little daughter is dying, he said. Please come and lay your hands on her. Heal her so she can live. Jesus went with him, and all the people followed, crowding around him. A woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. She had suffered a great deal from many doctors, and over the years, she had spent everything she had to pay to pay them. But she had begotten no better. She had gotten no better. In fact, she got worse. She had heard about Jesus, so she came up behind him through the crowd and touched his robe. For she thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. Immediately the bleeding stopped and she could feel in her body that she had been healed for her terrible condition. Jesus realized at once that healing power had gone out from him. So he turned around in the crowds and asked, who touched my robe? His disciples said to him, look at this crowd pressing around you. How can you ask who touched me? But he kept on looking around to see who had done it. Then the frightened woman, trembling at the realization of what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and told him what she has done. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. See, what goes on right there, we don't notice, we don't realize that Jesus is asking, who did this? You think Jesus didn't know? Of course he did know. But in order for her to respond, that was her way of saying, worshiping, thank you, acknowledging Jesus. She knew she got healed and she knew Jesus did it. So she came up and boldly in obedience said, it was me. She wasn't supposed to touch anybody. She was unclean. So here she came out, take a step of faith and obedience. And, and, and in that, Jesus responds, daughter, your faith had made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. God continues that peace, confirms that peace, and she lives in peace. Amen. I want to stop there. Our time is over. We have a minute and 30 seconds left. I want to thank God for the opportunity to make a San Mansa to read through the Bible. Uh, I will be doing this more often. I'm going to try so that I could read to inspire you, to encourage you, so that you would be hungry and thirsty for the Word of God. So I want to encourage you, get ready for Q&A at 8 o'clock. Write down your Bible questions. I read a lot of Bible right now, five chapters. So in those five chapters, if you stood with me, you must have a question. So I will see you at 8 o'clock. Read your word, write down your Bible questions and your prayer request. Amen. God bless you, everybody. Thank you for the privilege, the honor to read the word for you. I pray that it was a blessing for you. I pray that God spoke to you. God will always speak if you're willing to hear. So let's hear God's word. Faith comes from hearing the word of God. Our faith grew in this hour. May it continue to grow every day. In Jesus' name. God bless you, everybody. I will see you on the internet.